Derby is not just a horse race. It's a yearly event which carries great social importance to which the race itself is pretty much secondary. In 1913, King George V was among the societal elite in attendance. 
He entered a horse called Anmer, which he owned, and as the horses rounded the final corner, Anmer was third from last. A woman <coughs> emerged from the huge crowds and threw herself in front of him. A woman took the full force of a galloping thoroughbred hitting her. A woman called Emily Wilding Davison died for her cause that day as she attempted to attach flags bearing the suffragette colours to the king's horse. This is what a true feminist icon looks like. An icon can't just be someone who succeeded in a male-dominated field. It should be someone who has succeeded also somewhat in intentionally improving the lives of other women. A woman who succeeded where no other woman did before can be inspiring, certainly, but this does not necessarily make her iconic. So there are three main points I'm going to make tonight which should convince you that Wonder Woman's iconic feminist status is regrettable. The first being the creation of the Wonder Woman character and how she was never inherently iconic. The second, how she fails to represent women as a whole. And finally, I'll briefly touch on the main issues we have with the movie and with deeming its subject a feminist icon. So the, the original creator of Wonder Woman is a man called William Marston and he has some very complex and unorthodox views about gender, relationships and sex. And he wrote about women being superior to men. He didn't want men to be part of Diana's origin, which is Wonder Woman's original name. And in his version, she was born on a paradise island that was home to Amazons, women who were enslaved by mankind and then broke free. And they raised Diana, who was born out of clay and thus apparently didn't need a father. She was raised in a perfect world, on a perfect island, inhabited solely by women. A deliberate decision on his part. He borrowed Wonder Woman's origin story from feminist utopian fiction, but the point of utopia is that it's not real, just like the iconic status of the feminist who the op bench here holds so dear. Feminism is defined loosely as the advocacy of women's rights on the grounds of political, social and economic equality to men. So this means the focus is on equality, not superiority, not sameness, and not any of the other things that Marston seemed to be thinking of when he created this supposed icon. So not in a single comic book in which Wonder Woman appeared lacked a scene of bondage. Page after page, she's chained, tied, gagged and bound. She's locked in a bank vault, she's tied to railroad tracks, and to be honest, quite how Op could claim this story embraces a woman's right is something I just can't fathom because it is not iconic feminism. It's nothing more than feminism as a fetish. So secondly, onto this idea of diversity. I feel like for this debate, there's some sort of voice being like, hey, look, white feminists, DC finally has a superhero for you. How marvelous that you now have the badass, cisgendered, able-bodied, thin white woman you waited so long for. <laughs> and I know I sound salty, and I should be happy that the world has Wonder Woman, because when white women succeed, everybody succeeds. Am I right? <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, so before we do a round of high fives and declare, oh look gals, we've come such a long way, uh, let's consider what this actually says about feminism. See, what's lacking in all of these positive reviews of Wonder Woman is this idea of intersectionality. The acknowledgement that women's multiple identities, be it sex, gender identity, race, class, etc., expose them to many forms of oppression. So in the end, despite its efforts, Wonder Woman merely exposes the dominant narrative of white girl feminism. This is a feminism which, even if it claims to strive for inclusion, has a consistent ability to ignore the ways in which it can also trample on women. Feminism rooted in oppression is no feminism at all, just as the woman who represents it is no icon. Intersectionality just isn't enough if the only intersections that Ray to mention are Western white girls. Unless you concede your feminism is only about you, you can't claim that she empowers all women either. And finally, I'm just going to talk about the movie. So everyone seems convinced that the success of the Wonder Woman film had finally broken the glass ceiling and it had ushered in a new era of feminist filmmaking and we on Pop Prop disagree, and to be honest, that glass is so unbroken, it might as well be concrete. Like, 
This is not a joyous, happy, fun superhero movie. It's a series of <coughs> lingering shots of women's legs, and it clunks with dialogue that all but stops, of, all but stops short of saying, oh, hashtag feminism. It's broken records for being the biggest live action box office hit by a female director. But the actual script falls, sh falls short of smashing any stereotypes at all, let alone the patriarchy. But enough already with all of these gushing pink pieces citing Wonder Woman as the feminist icon little girls need. So take, for example, Katniss Everdeen from The Hunger Games. At least she didn't have to wear a teenager's wet dream of a costume to fight in. Oh, but it's practical, the movie argues. No, it's not. Like, <coughs> what's practical about having that much flesh exposed when you're facing gunfire? And if, like, suppose... No, thank you. Um, and if supposedly being semi-naked is the most practical mode in which we can save the world, why doesn't Batman wear a mankini? <laughs> so we, we on Proc would suggest that in a feminist movie, it's not who she is on the outside, but what she does <coughs> that should define the heroine, that should make her the icon. Her sex appeal should be tertiary or just not highlighted at all, especially in dialogue. We can make up our own minds about her attractiveness. We don't need it to be pointed out to us. This aspect of the film is indicative of society's huge overemphasis on women's looks. But Wonder Woman's beauty, her bone structure, her sexiness, <coughs> that should not be the focus if she's to be the legitimate feminist icon that Ock want her to be. And it is for this reason, and the ones mentioned earlier in my speech, that this side of the house regrets her as such. How to propose. <laughs> I have a bit of paper to move around before I get to making my speech. <laughs> I'm so sorry. doesn't get any better. I still need like 10 seconds of paper rearranging time, I'm afraid. For those who can't see the below. There is rather, rather a good bit of paper, I'm afraid. They're numbered. They are numbered. I'm pleased that somebody appreciates that. <laughs> within the light, seen the worst of the world and the best, seen the terrible things men do to each other in the name of hatred and the lengths they'll go to for love. Now I know only love can save this world, so I stay, I fight and I give, for the world I know can be. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a quote from the recent Wonder Woman film. This is a quote that shows us the idealism that lives on within Diana Price and what I think should be the real focus of this debate, right? Because so far what we've heard from Sarah is that what we should actually aspire to and what a feminist icon should be is someone who has succeeded in making lives better for women. But is that to say that we cannot idolise fictional women? Because for me, a feminist who seeks to idolise other feminists, an icon is someone who I can admire, who has lessons to teach me and experiences to relate to. And for me, a fictional person can do all of these things, perhaps uniquely in that I can read about their experiences in a way that I probably can never read about the experiences of a real person, right? And yes, in response to Sarah, Wonder Woman the film or the comics didn't end sexism, but I'm not sure that that's a fair burden to place upon a film or comic book series. Um, and I think that instead of talking about what Wonder Woman isn't, we should talk about what she is. Because ladies and gentlemen, prop one to say that Wonder Woman must be all things to all people. They complain that she is too beautiful, that she is white, that she is cisgendered, that she is heterosexual, that she is too quick to fall in love, that she is too much the physical ideal that most women cannot hope to live up to. 
But the truth is that no woman can be all things. Like, if she were all of the things that we might like to see represented at once, she would be purely a tokenist ideal. She would be not something that we could actually believe was written meaningfully with those experiences, right? The other thing is, like, she's from Kamiskira. She grew up on an, on an island completely surrounded by women. Even if she were, like, a person of colour, she wouldn't necessarily have had the same experiences that a person of colour on earth would have had, given this background, right? Wonder Woman cannot be all things to all women, and indeed, no woman can be, and it is incredibly unfair to place that burden upon Wonder Woman, right? So, firstly, within this speech, I'm going to talk about how she subverts gender norms, secondly, how she is a survivor, and thirdly, how she is something that we can all aspire to and all idolise. So, firstly, on subverting gender norms. All the stuff that we get from Sarah about how she is like tied to train tracks, about how she was put in these places of extreme vulnerability, she breaks out of these scenarios in every situation. She always emerges the hero, right? She escapes, she perseveres against all odds. Yes, she is beautiful. Yes, she's gorgeous. Yes, we see her thighs, we see her arms. She is half naked for most of the time. But this is for her strength, right? She, yes, to a certain extent she is sexualized, but also she uses her thighs to fight. She uses her <laughs> arms to punch. She is a woman whose body is exposed so that it can do things. She is a woman whose body I would aspire to have. A body of strength, a body of movement, a body that achieves things, right? So what if she's beautiful? She's in control of her body and her image. And I personally don't think that there's anything wrong with a woman being beautiful or a woman owning her own body and making the choice to expose her arms or her legs or whatever part of her body she wishes to, right? But secondly, on how she's a survivor, no thank you. Diana has seen the cruelty of humanity, but she has also seen its goodness. She understands that there is no quick fix, right? Killing Ares in the film doesn't fix every problem or end all war, and this disappoints her, right? This makes her so upset that she could not fix the world in the way that she imagined that she could. She believed that she could easily save everybody, that that was what a hero was. But throughout her narrative, she comes to learn that being a hero isn't about solving everything immediately, right? She realizes that she can't do that, yet she doesn't give up. I think that's what a real hero is, knowing that what you're going to do won't necessarily achieve everything, but knowing that you have to do it nonetheless. She goes out each night and she tries again to save as many people as she can to do what is within her power. Even though the world that she aspires to is so distant from her reach, and she recognises this because she sees the evil both in men and in women and the good, she still pushes for it and dreams for it because she imagines a world that can be better. And I think that that's exactly what I would like to idolise and exactly what I would like all women and feminists to idolise, right? Because I don't need to idolise a woman who is everything, who is perfect in every way, who achieves everything she does. And in fact, if I were to idolise a, a woman who did these things, I don't think I could relate to her. I don't think I could understand that because I'm not perfect. I don't know a single woman, even though I know many great women, who are who is perfect, right? Um. I don't know anyone. <laughs> Sorry, Beth. of course you're an exception. But I don't know any woman who doesn't make any mistakes, right? And I think what is so uniquely powerful about Diana Price, about Wonder Woman, is that she is constantly in the narrative of trying to rediscover what she can do, of trying to discover what is good and what is right. And I think that there is something so beautiful about the concept of a hero who comes from another world, who thinks that there is something she can salvage within humanity and who believes it is her duty to salvage. Because I don't think feminism is about being right all of the time. I don't think feminism is about being perfect or being all things to all women. Because women aren't homogenous. You can never be all things to all women, right? I think feminism is about constantly rediscovering what is right and what is true and re-examining your purpose within that. And I think what is so powerful about Wonder Woman is that as she says, now I know only love can save this world. So I stay, I fight and I give for the world I know I can be. She has this incredible conviction. The world is so far from what she had dreamed and she had imagined she could save it so easily. Yet she realizes that she cannot and still she perseveres. She realizes that there may always be adversity. There may always be forces which she can't defeat. She realizes that she is not all things to all women, that she cannot be perfect, that she cannot be the ideal she might have dreamed, yet still she realizes that she must try, she must strive, right? And for me, that's what feminism is about. Feminism is about trying. Feminism is about constantly trying. 
And for me, that's what makes Wonder Woman such a feminist icon. Not that she's achieved things for the grander scheme of the world, though to be fair, I don't think it's fair to hold her to standards that you wouldn't hold a male superhero to. But I don't think it's that she's achieved anything fantastic necessarily, but rather <coughs> that she is someone who I and other women and other people can look up to, can aspire to, can dream to be like. I am so, so, so proud to oppose. stuff at the start or I, like just kind of throughout so I'm not like just basically repeating what Sarah said so my speech first of all is going to be directed at first the Wonder Woman film kind of franchise itself and second like the character of Wonder Woman in like the new film I'm not going really going to be touching on like kind of any of the earlier films because I kind of assumed that everyone would be talking about like the 2017 version and how instead of portraying strong independent women both aspects portray like the single vision of male fantasy so let's get this straight Wonder Woman was literally made from clay. She is born the daughter of Zeus. Um, Wonder, Woman, Wonder Woman is purely, she's fantastical. Her story takes its cue from um, classical mythology. Her lasso of truth and her indestructible bracelets are magical. But that is what we expect from like mainstream superhero blockbuster films, right? They're made for men. So let's start. I can't pronounce the name of the place where she's from, but I'm going to assume it's like Temiscara or something like that. Tem Temiscara. So it's a feminist utopia that consists purely of female warriors. Feminist, right? We don't need any men, right? We're hardcore and we fight and therefore we're super feminist, right? No, wrong. It consists of, they're all victorious, like Victoria's Secret Angels. Um, literally the only woman with any sort of imperfections was Robin Wright's character, who's, who like had like a sort of battle scar on her shoulder so she looked kind of more convincing from that she looked kind of fierce but where are the other wounded they're supposed to be warriors and that they, they literally have no scars on them they literally look like supermodels so like i've said before this movie is directed to men no matter how much we try to fight it it's an island full of beautiful women as hot as like also i can't pronounce her last name so i'm gonna go like gadot i'm not really sure so they're all as hot as gal Gad gadot and um, none like so she is probably every man's wet dream. Add in like the kick-ass fighting gear and like the supermodel bodies and you've got yourself an encore. The movie is essentially just a series of like lingering shots of her thighs as she's like running and fighting and stuff. So what makes this film super unrealistic, aside from the whole superhero part of it, um, <laughs> is the fact that Diana Prince, I think is her name, was... Um, was promoted as this like super feminist, super every girl, the one to aspire to be and whatnot. But not only does she fight in tight figure hugging uniform, uh, showing far too much skin on a battlefield, like facing gunfire, but she does it with her hair down. Now let me say one thing. Walking around with your hair down is hard. I am not gonna lie. Like I have my hair down right now and I am constantly changing it. Like you're walking around college and like the wind is like blowing it in your face and it goes into your mouth and it goes into your eyes. Like not only does she fight, but she runs, she does everything with her hair down and it stays perfect. Like that's not how things, things goes, right? So the fact that she can do this in like the whole movie, it's just completely unrealistic. So Catherine has talked about how one person cannot be all things to all women. But one character literally describes her as the most beautiful woman you have ever seen. So these are the sort of impossible standards that we're trying to set ourselves to. The most highly anticipated on-screen feminist icon not only has super strength, unwavering bravery, I'm pretty sure she can fly, she speaks hundreds of languages, but she also looks like Miss World. So her male companions, 
in the fight in, in like the World War One, for I say two, <laughs> the World War One forces, they drool behind her back at the notion that there is an island somewhere full of women who look like her, with no men in sight. So when she walks into a room, even dressed in like this plain grey suit and like a bowler hat, instead of her usual like kind of sexy and sensual armoured leotard, men just go silent and they stare at her. Can you imagine? <coughs> Um, no, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, can you imagine Lois Lane commenting, I'm both frightened and aroused, after Superman single-handedly brings down a bar brawl to its knees? No, but that's exactly what happens when Wonder Woman unleashes like a, this cool-ass can of whoop-ass in one scene. So enough with all of the gushing about how Wonder Woman is like the role model that little girls should aspire to be. Like Sarah has said, what about Katniss Everdeen, right? At least she fought against a system of oppression, not covered in makeup in every single scene, in realistic clothing, with her freaking hair in a ponytail. And the only times she ever dressed up was when she needed to for like ceremonies and like when the president wanted her to like look nice for stuff. <coughs> so Catherine has talked about how we should idealize or like idolize fictional characters. And yeah, I'm all for it, like go Katniss. But like Wonder Woman walks around in these like super tight, like like yeah, very erotic, but like it's just it's not very like feminist as the upside is trying to say. It's just for like men to watch and to just like idolise about. So perhaps I, a person, I like, you know, I read and I discuss like gender and feminism in the hist all the time in a college debating society, and I haven't seen a lot of like superhero movies or superhero stuff to be impressed by the mere existence of a female protagonist, because I'm not really into like superhero stuff like that. Maybe I am the wrong audience for this film. Um, perhaps I was too distracted by like the figure skater dress that she wears for most of this film, sculpted with these like tiny bumps for her like ever apparently like erect nipples all of the time, <laughs> to applaud like the heavy handled lines like, what I do is not up to you. That gesture towards like female empowerment. Like I was, like, I was wondering why I'd expected some, like, energising, like, woke feminist manifesto instead of a film that stars one sexy woman surrounded by throngs of, like, horny men, barely passing the Bechtel test past the first scene on, like, her home island. So, I couldn't really come up with, like, a closing part to my speech. So, I'm just going to say um, that while Op think that, like, you know, this film is, like, super feminist and stuff, in the original, like, in Wonder Woman, she's supposed to be a lesbian. That is the whole point of it. Like, there is a, I can't remember the exact quote from the movie and from the comic books, but she says um, to her, like, hot sidekick guy that, like, men are used for reproduction but not necessarily for pleasure. So it's known that she's a lesbian, but then in the movie, they have her fall in love with her male sidekick. Like, not pretty cool, but like, so basically everything that I've said so far, um, like, yeah, <laughs> I'm not really sure I'd finish this up, but yes, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> icon and my speech has three main points in defense of this <laughs> firstly that women who are supposedly over sexualized and conventionally attractive can be just as feminist as those women who do not fall into those categories and those who, and those who promote the idea that attractive women are somehow less feminist or less worthy of the title feminist aren't exactly pr practicing a very inclusive form of feminism themselves yeah, yeah, yeah. Second, 
that the unbelievable success of the recent film absolutely legitimises Wonder Woman as a feminist icon because it made a female-directed story about female characters popular with a general audience, whereas all too often female characters are demoted to the background and supporting roles because of a widely prevailing belief that only certain women and certainly no men uh, would, would enjoy stories about women, so they'd be commercially unviable. And finally... Wonder Woman is certainly a feminist icon because of the way she is depicted, not just that she is depicted at all. But first, as a point of rebuttal, in the case of Wonder Woman wearing an attractive costume, you know, for instance, Batman, I think he wears a rather attractive costume, and I have no problem with saying that. Just because someone finds Wonder Woman attractive, I don't think delegitimizes her as a feminist icon, and you don't make the same complaint about a man wearing an attractive costume. So on to my first point that conventionally attractive and sexualized women are not bad feminists just for being so. Women can be feminist icons of all shapes and sizes. We hear this argument a lot lately regarding things like body positivity and fat shaming and the like. This is very welcome progress from before, where it was more socially acceptable to shame women and men, but obviously less so, for aspects of their appearance, often those which they could do nothing to change. This assertion that feminist icons can come in any and all shapes and sizes would include Gal Gadot, the actress who played the most recent incarnation of Wonder Woman. However, an unwelcome side effect of this progress is that, no thank you, is that now it's okay to criticize someone, and let's face it, it's usually a woman on the brunt of this criticism for being conventionally good looking, and use this question and to how they, how well they, could they possibly understand feminism being good looking, or criticize that they couldn't possibly be as feminist as someone who has been body shamed just because they haven't suffered like those have. This makes no sense, because if feminism is, as it is defined by the Oxford English Dictionary, the advocacy of women's rights on the ground of equality of the sexes, then it is not a feminist act to claim that only certain types of women are good feminists and some are not. Especially, no thank you, especially if this is because of things that women cannot or should not have to change, such as their appearance, or the fact that society finds them attractive. This is just body shaming again in reverse, and I've already established and so have several other people that that's wrong. A feminist can be extremely plain or the most gorgeous woman to have ever lived. I certainly don't see anything wrong in some feminist icons being conventionally good looking. Wonder Woman is gorgeous, but after all, she is a superhero, and superheroes do tend to have rather jaw dropping physiques. I know that I personally have no idea what the plot was of the 2016 film Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. I was rather distracted by less lofty thoughts throughout it. So I, don't really, so I don't really see a huge issue with people having similar thoughts during Wonder Woman. I actually see that as a win for equality. Um, and so on to my second point, that the recent film Wonder Woman was massively popular with general society, giving it a feminist icon status for breaking, no thank you Catherine, especially for, bre for breaking down the incorrect assumption that men don't enjoy films about women, and you know, it's only ever going to be popular with a very niche audience of a certain type of woman. Wonder Woman's entire first act is about an island populated entirely with women, and men play a very much secondary role throughout the entire film. This, is an, this in itself should make Wonder Woman worthy for consideration as a feminist icon because it is an example of a film directed by a woman and centrally focused on women being extremely popular with a general audience. Wonder Woman is actually involved in the central storyline, unlike so many films where men save the day and the, and the woman is actually mean, you know, just there to clean up around the edges. No, thank you, Sarah. The recent film is the highest grossing film ever directed by a woman and the seventh highest grossing film of 2017. For a character and a film to prove that women's stories can be just as fun and entertaining and as a result just as popular of those as men surely does make Wonder Woman a feminist icon. And on the point about the comic books being problematic, if you'll excuse the phrasing. Um, I think feminism evolves, just like language evolves and society evolves, so I don't see why we should be constantly hamstrung by the faults of something decades ago and criticising something in today. So, my final point, that Wonder Woman is a feminist icon, not just for the fact that the film about her was made and that she was the central character to it, but also for the way she was depicted in it. Wonder Woman is portrayed as the absolute equal, and actually in most cases the superior, of any of the men she faces during the recent film. 
She rolls her eyes at the concept of being a secretary, comparing it to being a slave, and personally engages in fighting the Germans, rather than just leaving it to the men to do so. She plays an active rather than a passive role throughout the film, which in my opinion qualifies her as a feminist and is quite unusual in many, in many films these days, even in this age of so-called equality and enlightenment. So, in conclusion, I, I beg you to think that Wonder Woman is absolutely a feminist icon. Her attractiveness doesn't disqualify her from her status as a feminist icon. She is a female character who is extremely popular with a general audience and plays an active and not passive role in the movie and even in the original comic books. Unlike many other female, famous female characters, and for those reasons, I beg to oppose this motion. <laughs> So I'm a big fan of comics and superhero stories generally, so you may have noticed me slowly dying on the bench there as the entirety of the debate was revolving around the movie and I count to now seven mistakes related to Wonder Woman and two related to Katniss Everdeen. Um, and I do think that Wonder Woman was by far the best movie DC have ever made. <laughs> high praise. But, like, in all seriousness, it was a very, very good movie. But I really want to step back from a moment, for a moment and say to her, you know, let's imagine we were in DC Studios before that. And they had the choice. They have a full roster of heroes. They could make new characters. They had the option of trying to rehabilitate and take back this old character with a huge amount of really negative historic baggage and trying to fix it. <laughs> or they could have just started afresh. And I'm going to say that really, for the, for the sake of feminism, it's a no-brainer. They should really have started afresh. I'm going to weigh up first the negative aspects, why it's the baggage that comes with Wonder Woman, and then look at the few positive aspects that come with keeping her as a character. So the negative aspects, as has been briefly alluded to, uh, the cr original creator had some really weird ideas about women, and it comes through in his work. Uh, this is a superhero that draws their powers not from them, but from their magic items, which are the bracelets of submission and the whip of truth. You may have guessed this person was big into bondage. <laughs> and uh, you, you may... You, like, this is a character that loses their powers if ever they are tied up by a man, specifically which is something slightly more common than kryptonite and offers a lot of plot lines that, uh, a lot of plot lines that allow for the rest of the Justice League to rescue the damsel in distress and look marginally more competent. This is a character that, yes, in the film says, so wait, the secretary is some sort of a slave? No, this is, the Wonder Woman is a character that spent nearly a decade allowed in the Justice League only as secretary. None of the others had any roles. They were just in the Justice League. She was the only one that was the secretary because comic code, yes. When you say about her actual normal lines of what that's in the Justice League comic book series, but yes. in a normal with Wonder Woman and sensational comics, she's like that's her own storyline. She's written by different characters, by different writers in those aspects. That is true. And I'm gonna actually about that bit about different writers. That's actually a really big problem. Um, the, um, Wonder Woman is nothing more than an empty vessel in which each writer, nearly all, the majority of which are male, um, placed upon her their own fantasies of what a, an ideal woman is. And some of those, you know, some of those views, as you may have realized, were pretty poor. This is a character that spent issues pining over Steve Trevor's. This is like. Anyone who's wondering why the pilot was killed off in the film, that's because nobody wanted to repeat of her saying, oh, I'm so jealous I read, uh, of anyone who has a normal life because all I want to be is a wife and a mother and I wish I wasn't a superhero. That character needed to go. Um, yeah. Um, and, that's, and on the other side, what are the positive aspects? Well, is this a character that has, you know, like, vulnerability, something that makes them human, something that makes them a character, you know, a backstory. 
Not really. This is a character that's gone through about seven different backstories. The, um, wasn't daughter of Zeus, Aris in some versions, but was in some other versions made from clay. In some of the versions, she's randomly an orphan in New York. Um, there's no, the, it is only worth rehabilitating a character because that is something that can be done. Some brands have been rehabilitated. ADOS is a company that made huge efforts um, to rehabilitate its video game characters. But this isn't worth it here because there is nothing to look up to in this character beyond the fact that her you know, body superpowers is you know, kicking ass. That's about it. I dare someone on this side to say something about her other than she's a woman, she's wonderful, she <laughs> is a superhero with bracelets of submission. I'd like everyone in this room to think about, you know, pick a character, Superman, Batman, or Wonder Woman. And I want you in your head, I want you in your head, I want you, no, no, I want you in your head to answer these questions as I give them. What city do they operate in? Okay. What, like, what is their, what are their motives? Where are they from? Why are they fight, you know, why are they fighting crime? Can you name a single aspect about her personality that you wasn't told in the films, which was a complete reinvention? If you're going to reinvent an entire character from scratch, then why not just make a new one that doesn't have all of that terrible baggage? Yes? Sorry, but what does Batman have with billions of dollars and daddy issues? Like, is it... <laughs> story is he's first of all he's fighting crime because his parents are killed you are correct but that's a motive and it is also a flaw his ruthlessness comes to costs him right but that is not something you can say for wonder woman you've gone on and on about how um, a, an icon can't be perfect can you name a single flaw that wonder woman has can you name a single you know aspect of her personality at all you have her consistent, consistently referred to as diana price it's Prince. <laughs> so yeah, if we're going to be making an entirely new character, which is what this function is, this was an origin story. This is a character that has so little to them that they had to make an entire movie teaching the audience who they were. Right? If you're going to do that, well, DC could have pulled their roster up and said, well, we have Starfire, Raven, Miss Martian, Zatanna, Black Canary. Or we're not necessarily looking, looking for someone from DC, because we're not limited to that. We're looking for someone in comics generally. Well, we could go for She-Hulk. At least that's someone that's known, that has a, an actual job, as opposed to alternating between being a diplomat, a journalist, a double agent, or no job at all, or a secretary. We could be going for uh, Storm, we could be going for Rogue, we could be going for Jessica Jones, or we could Ooh. be going even for Squirrel Girl. But two characters, <laughs> I'm sorry, Squirrel Girl actually demonstrates like resourcefulness. <laughs> Jessica, jo <laughs> Jessica Jones demonstrates determination. <laughs> Can anyone tell me of a single time when one of them has demonstrated resourcefulness? Or we could be going to the new characters, because there are characters that are filling those gaps. Miss Marvel is an Arab Muslim girl going to school in New York who can change size and whose fists go through walls. There is nothing in that premise you do not like. I beg you to propose. The applause, thanks. So, um, it's lovely to be here, by the way. Um, before I get into my main points, I want to sort of legitimize Wonder Woman as a feminist. I know that it stayed in the motion, but I feel it's important to protect her from some of the scathing attacks she's been subjected to by the proposition. So I look to myself for this, and to my own actions, as usual. I proudly call myself a feminist, but often slip up in that quest for gender equality. Like, Wonder Woman does a lot better than me, anyway. Wonder Woman's copy of The Second Sex isn't gathering dust on her bookshelf, and Wonder Woman doesn't tell people she's read it anyway. 
Wonder Woman does not messy text her ex every time she gets a cider into her. And when Wonder Woman was filling out her CEO, she did not make that decision based on the fact that her other ex will be doing the same course in UCD. <laughs> Wonder Woman has never knowingly shifted a Fina Gaylor. And do you know what? <laughs> and do you know what? Wonder Woman's never faked it. And granted, I have no evidence of this, but I'm pretty sure that Wonder Woman doesn't like secretly think that David Cameron used to be kind of hot. And, <laughs> and if I, a proud and active feminist, can make all those mistakes without regretting my identity as a feminist, why can't Wonder Woman wear a skimpy outfit, as the proposition say, while fighting crime? So, the most embarrassing thing I've ever said to an, an audience aside, I have three main points that I'll be getting to. First, I'm going to talk about the virtue that I find, find in Wonder Woman's femininity and why that's important to me personally. <coughs> then I'll move on to Wonder Woman's upbringing and why that is so feminist to me. And I'll finish with a little bit on the transcendent nature of Wonder Woman and how even though we may regret elements of her, we do have the power to change her. But first, a little bit of rebuttal. Like you were saying that... Um, like there are loads of other wonderful, wonderful superheroes, but that doesn't mean that we can't idolize Wonder Woman. That doesn't mean that we can't find her a feminist just because other good ones exist. So, <laughs> so um, on to my first point. There's this really good episode of Frasier. With, like, bear with me. Um, a, it's a sitcom about a radio psychiatrist, and our terribly intellectual protagonist, Frasier, invites everybody to a party and invites them to dress as their personal heroes. And Roz, his Producer, produ producer, who's a little dim, comes as Wonder Woman, and Fraser like berates her. He's like, "Oh, no, not a superhero, like your personal hero," and this rings true in real life. We get a lot of this from people, and like, let's be real, like men in particular, they don't see Wonder Woman as like an acceptable feminist icon. Um, if our role models are fun and sparkly and wear skimpy clothing, that can never be serious, right? If they don't act as our role models. Um, if they don't act as masculine as possible, they can't be feminist icons. And this is a symptom of misogyny, one that both Wonder Woman and the rest of us women are subjected to constantly. I know that this isn't an argument that the opposition are particularly pushing, but it's a big reason that I don't regret Wonder Woman as a feminist icon. She's strong and she's powerful without giving up her femininity. I think a lot of women go through this phase, like at the start of their feminism, where they believe to be a real feminist is to reject femininity. It's to like cut all your hair off, burn your bra, and start dressing in suits, and power to you, to be honest. It's fine if you want to do that, but I never did. And seeing Wonder Woman fighting bad guys and flying into the sunset without giving up her sparkly tiara and her long hair really helps me. She epitomizes the, in my, in my opinion, incredibly important idea that you can be strong and fem feminine. So, back to Fraser. <laughs> At the end of the episode, it's revealed that Roz's personal hero is, in fact, Wonder Woman. She was just too embarrassed to say. And Prop asks for personality traits of Wonder Woman, and Roz responds. She <laughs> says she's smart and moral and totally independent. You're all right. And those, um, and those are incredibly important characteristics of, an, of a feminist icon, as the motion puts it. Strength with morality. Wonder Woman teaches us that being physically strong isn't enough. You need the lasso, but you need the truth as well. The strength to stand up for what we believe in, the strength to be loyal, to help those in need, a strength she learned from her upbringing. And moving on to uh, Wonder Woman's upbringing, her background is incredibly feminist to me. She's an Amazon born into a family of women, and I'm not like, I don't think it's feminist just because like oh it's all women and we're all very strong the reason i particularly it's the reason i particularly adore her moral coat batman's strength is from dealing with fear superman's is from like i don't know like the printing press or whatever like decline of journalism <laughs> <laughs> but wonder woman her incredible traits are born from womanhood all our lives we are taught that women are that as women our fundamental traits are nurturing submission cooking cleaning etc but Wonder Woman shows us that we have strength, morals, and independence within us. These are things we learn from other women. From other women. What is more feminist than that? So I'm going to go on to my third point, but I'll start by conceding that there are elements of today's Wonder Woman, which I do regret. Um, but I want to discuss the transcendent nature of Wonder Woman and like fictional icons in general. You see, she has changed so much, like as the, as the proposition even have continuously discussed. She begins as this kind of like non-violent antidote, as her problematic creator puts it, to blood-curdling masculinity. <coughs> but now we see her portrayed as this kind of more kick-ass, again, as the opposite, a superhero who turns to violence to the exact same extent of her male colleagues, again, Superman, Batman, like, etc. Um, while I believe that this development is regrettable, um, 
but it really shows us the scope for change around one to one. Woman. We hear a lot of talk about the creator for MOP, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't be an I that she shouldn't be an icon. If we were to like rely on the creator for our enjoyment and our idolization of figures, you're all right. Um, um, for in all of our media consumption, then we wouldn't be able to watch anything at all. There are 15 on-screen versions of Wonder Woman alone, all of whom bring different things to the table, from like the pie jiggling Captain Kirk 2017 Wonder Woman to the 2017 American flag waving Lydia, Lydia Carter. And I want to make it clear, I think all of these depictions have merit in their own right. Wonder Woman never really loses that strength with morality that I personally idolize so much, that I personally admire so much. Um, pardon me. I'm only showing you these examples to explain just how much potential lies in Diana. Um, I don't think it's responsible to regret a character who has so much further to go. I mean, like, who knows, by 2020 she could be like a bisexual socialist who never la lays eyes on Chris Pine. That would be the goal, to be honest. So, um, just to finish, I adore Wonder Woman. I've always looked up to her. And if I were to regret her standing as a feminist icon, I would be turning my back on my younger self and on Roz Doyle from the popular sitcom Frasier, spin off to the popular sitcom Cheers. Um, I am proud to oppose the motion and I beg you to be <laughs> she says that not all women can be all things but they can feel real and they can be unique and they cannot be a misogynistic stereotype and I say we need more we deserve more and we should strive for more because it is not enough for a woman to merely exist to be a feminist icon and we are told time and time again that we should look to these perfect women and um, that we have so graciously been granted and find our salvation our representation our equality but that kind of representation is a lie and is one that we are forced to swallow every day one that girls are told to look to and to see themselves knowing that it is impossible but continuing to look anyway that is not an icon Impression, uh, oppression and empowerment go hand in hand in this case, and they'd be quite hard to disentangle. But what we are offered in Wonder Woman is a woman created in the male gaze that we are told over and over, no, no, this is what empowerment looks like. But it's a guise for the continued narrative of repression that we see time and time again. Two points in this speech. First of one, about the male gaze. It's been covered quite a lot, but something I want to point out to opposition, right? It's great that a woman can be feminine, feminine and do stuff, but it's not Wonder Woman's choice to be feminine, right? Uh, she is feminine because there's nothing else open, there's nothing else that she is allowed to be. That is the only type of hero that we see, and that is a massive problem, okay? Lizzie says this shouldn't detract from what she does, and there can be heroes of all sizes, this person included. The problem is that we do not see heroes of all sizes. We see one very specific type, and that is a problem, and we shouldn't buy into that. Um, no thank you. When you look to Wonder Woman, you can see that she was created by a man, not just someone looking for a cool character, so, like, 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 but the ideal woman. And I would class her as like the precursor to like the manic pixie dream girl, and the embodiment of the strong female character. <laughs> Right? You know, she is strong, but by the way, has no muscles like, or no, no, no like big buff things to take away from that femininity, right? Despite the fact that she can jump like over the Thames or something. Um, and she doesn't have much else. She's essentially a fairly bland character with nothing going on except this like broad, overarching purpose and kind of a weird innocence about the world. It's not enough for opposition to quote her because those words uh, like, like, were written by a man for her to say and she essentially becomes a pirate. I want my superwoman not just to be like this sexy woman wearing sexy clothes that can keep up with the lads, yeah? Because when you get that kind of character, it's literally just a big bag of patriarchy with the lads, right? And that is the issue. 
There, there, there are a lot of problems with her character. I mean, like her whole appearance and, and the way that that's dealt with um, has been dealt with already. But two things to add to that, right? It's fundamentally reinforced when, in the movie, like the only evil woman and the only other woman that we see is disfigured, right? So you equate goodness and beauty and evilness and unattractiveness. And that is not an acceptable like thing to put on girls who see it. Secondly, on the clothing, all the Amazons wear heels. That is so impractical. There's no reason for them to do that. But moving on. The categorization of the Amazons themselves is something that I found quite interesting because I see them as essentially set up in gendered opposition to men because Amazons equal women equal love and peace, right? Whereas man equals war, um, which I thought was kind of weird because obviously gender, no thank you, necessarily comes into it because they're in an all-woman society. But the degree to which it's pushed that they're all about love and care and maternal things is kind of weird. Um, also, I think there's a degree to which they fulfill the noble savage stereotype, in that they have this amazing, amazing society, which is never fully fleshed out into this feminist utopia that ops talk about, because you kind of just get a bunch of women doing jump kicks or something. Um, but yet they have so much to learn from the one man who managed to crash land on their shore. Um, they don't know what a watch is, or what the outside world looked like, or, or what's going on, right? So despite being ancient, they're still at this disadvantage when the one man shows up, right? He gets still to claim power over them and to have this kind of influence. So I find problematic. Um, also, Diana is presented as quite sexually naive, right? From the get-go, she asks, like, what is that? And she's asking about a watch, but it's implied she doesn't know what a penis is. Um, and they talk, no thank you, about sex a lot, which is kind of weird that most of their conversations are innuendo, right? But, like, the guy managed to, co to come out on top out of all these things, but he seems to know what's going on. Uh, and she comes off quite, like, like, innocent rather than empowered, right? Um, also, the categorization of Diana, that she doesn't really understand war and needs a guy to explain to her that there's not just like one bad guy. She doesn't, like, like, she doesn't understand humans and how corrupt they are and whatever, but she's constantly told she's making a misstep and the guy really knows what's going on. And here it goes on. And herein lies the two fatal flaws that I find. One is that she falls for the first guy she ever meets, one who condescends to her all the time, um, and like as in, really never thought what she said made any sense at all until actually a literal god is flying about the sky and he's like, oh yeah. Um, so she doesn't have power in that relationship. And two, the very source of her power and her godlike whatever she can do is only in a man. It's only when she sees him die and the sacrifice he's ready to make that her power is unlocked. Uh, I, I, and that's a problem because it's when a male force finally believes in her, she can do all the stuff, which I'm like, like dude, like, no. Um, Second point is about Wonder Woman as an outsider to the feminist movement, right? Um, because even if she wasn't already problematic and all that weird stuff about bondage that was already brought up that I don't have to explain, um, then her status as an outsider to this world would make her unfit to be a feminist icon even still because she doesn't understand inequality because she's from like a literal utopia. Therefore, she cannot represent any kind of struggle against it. You cannot transplant someone into the world and make them a voice for a movement uh, that is formed from resisting the oppression of that world because she simply cannot relate to it. Um, she's never suffered sexism. She's never had to think about intersectionality. And this is a problem when they say, oh, she's a feminist because she rolls her eyes at the role of a secretary being a slave. But she never questions the sexism involved and doesn't understand why that might be problematic. She cannot stand for the critique and change of a system that she never had to be a part of. And maybe I can see that she's badass and can jump really far and stuff, but that's not enough because a feminist icon should be someone who has met the challenges of the world and bested them. And never, it, 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 it's nevertheless she persisted, not nevertheless she never had to fight for anything and surprise, surprise, ended up okay anyway, right? That's not the issue. Any action taken by Wonder Woman is not in defying sexist norms. It's it's simply being unaware of them ever having existed in the first place, which I think is an inherent problem in lauding her as a feminist icon. Um, because she's never had to be a feminist, and maybe that's because she's from this weird, awesome, like, matriarchy or whatever, but the problem remains the same, right? I want more than a woman to just exist to be a feminist icon, to have real things to overcome uh, the sexist, like, standards that we are held up to. Wonder Woman represents, like, a move to sell us the same standards with a cloak of, like, empowerment to keep us happy, right? And that is not enough. It is not <coughs> enough to tell us that we have this strong woman now, because that strong woman does not represent a feminist movement, and she actually buys into the male gaze and all the bad stuff I don't like, so I propose. I call upon Julia McCarthy to oppose the motion. I have a lot of pages, but none of them are numbered and none of them make sense to anyone. <laughs> 
It's just the truth of <coughs> almost all of my thoughts all the time. Um, so, it's a truth universally acknowledged that pop culture is singularly shitty to women. Um, it is an unfortunate and inescapable truth of life. We saw it this week with Harvey Weinstein. We saw it three years ago with the Sony hacked emails and the way they talked, particularly about female superheroes. We see it in literally every piece of media from pop culture that we consume all the time, from Taylor Swift to Kim Kardashian. It's literally everywhere and it's almost unstoppably shy. Um, I don't know what you guys did as children. As a small child, I, without fail, for most of my early Halloweens was a princess, or a queen, or a fairy, or something equally nebulously girly where I got to wear a lot of glitter. I still love the glitter. I'm not gonna pretend I didn't. Um, thankfully, when I was, that movie came out in about 1999, so I was actually about four, my mother very inappropriately brought me to the Matrix. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I developed what can only be described as a slightly creepy obsession with Trinity in The Matrix, which if you're not familiar is the female character in The Matrix. Uh, I will get to Wonder Woman eventually, I know it's a <laughs> strange path. Um, and I wore all black velvet for about two years. Um, <laughs> because my mother appropriately wouldn't buy me leather. Um, <laughs> but Trinity is, in my experience growing up, the first in a long line of kick-ass women who you learn the lesson that to be a feminist and to be a strong woman means you have to suffer. Throughout my experience, I'm a big pop culture fan, if it's a late 90s sci-fi show, I probably watched it as a young child. Consistently, I learned that it's a sacrifice. And what I love about Wonder Woman, and in particular in the later iterations of it, because like the 1940s iteration is obviously shit. Everything for women from the 1940s was shit. Can we not talk about it? Um, like, it's, she's hopeful. She doesn't have to suffer. Her gift and the fact that she chooses to fight for people is never shown to be like punishing to her. Like, I don't know about you guys, I was a massive Buffy fan, but every season of that show, she gets kicked in the teeth. She dies like twice. And the love of her life, she sleeps with, and he immediately turns evil, which like the sexuality of that show is really screwed up in a whole other way. Um, and like, if you want to talk about like, I idealized bodies of women, like talk about Joss Whedon shows, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, I love Sarah Michelle Gellar, but she's at like five, she's my height, and like she's tiny and she's kicking ass. It's the same thing in uh, Firefly, it's the same thing in Dollhouse, no thanks. And like at least Gal Gadot is tall, at least like you could believe that she would be able to kick someone in the teeth. Um, and it's just, I just really enjoyed sitting down to that movie and being like, this is not a woman who has suffered for her power. This is not a woman who has to sacrifice all the time, because that's ultimately what women are taught constantly. Women are taught that if you want to have a job and have a family, you're sacrificing something, that on some level you're a shitty parent or you're shitty at your work, or you'll get stuck at middle management. You get told that like, if you want to be an ambassador, you know, you're gonna have to send your children to that. You're told if you don't want children that you're a shitty person. Like you're told if you don't want to work and you just want to have children that you're also a bad feminist. There is no winning most of the time. And pop culture, and particularly science fiction and fantasy, constantly reinforces that in the most unpleasant way possible. And like Wonder Woman does it for once. Wonder Woman is a young woman who just kicks ass. And yes, it's flawed because as I will go back to my first literal sentence, Pop culture is unendingly crap for women, <laughs> and at least she's an improvement. And like, she is an icon because what an icon means is like this super above possibility, like thing. Everyone wants to be as hot as Gal Gadot. No thanks. Oh, actually, I'll take Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, like everyone probably wants to be as hot as Gal Gadot or as good as her or be capable of that much stuff, and we're not. And like an icon is above anything that's human. Like when you think of like Madonna being iconic, you don't think of scary Madonna arms as a 50 year old. You think of her in the Like a Virgin video when she's like just kicking ass. You don't think of things at their worst, you think of them at their best. Like that's what it means to be an icon. I know we haven't talked about that a lot this debate, but that is the image of it. Like to be iconic is to be wreathed in gold and like the best version of it. I'm an art histor history student, so it's a whole thing. Um, <laughs> Like, what I'd also say is, for, there is a popular theory in uh, the school of what I study, that for American culture, comic books are very like 
myths and legends from Greece, Rome, Egypt, <coughs> thick, you know, many countries. Uh, and what I love about Wonder Woman and literally any female story that comes out of comic books is that it's not a race. There's no erasure of it, which the problem with history is that we get many of the warrior women who were popular in myths and legends erased. Like as in Penthesilia, who's the original Amazon badass, deep cut for anyone who read the Odyssey. <laughs> um, she is... You know, she's murdered straight away. And there's definitely more stories in Greek mythology about the Amazons that we never get to hear because they weren't written down. The one, like, major female Greek character we get is Medea, who murdered her children. So she's not popular. Um, Irish history is particularly horrible for it. Irish myths and legends were massively erased by the Christian church. You know, there is a huge, like, store of stories that we just don't get to access and we, like, don't get to know what happened, really, essentially. And so we know that Irish culturally had a, like, consistent warrior women vibe. We don't actually know the stories. We really only get the taunt, which is the bulls, and everyone gets a bit bored and confused. Um, like, it's so frustrating, <laughs> is the only way I can describe it. And it's so... Having Wonder Woman as this incredible woman to aspire to, to look at, to represent all the warrior women who came before her is incredible. And the fact that she isn't punished for being a badass, she doubts herself briefly, yeah, but she did just murder a dude for the first time. Um, and it didn't do any of what she thought it was going to do, which is like pretty discouraging for anyone who's ever done anything that doesn't work. Like resetting your router and the Wi Fi still doesn't come back. <laughs> 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 Uh, so I'm very pleased. I realise Wonder Woman is still not an appropriate Halloween costume for small children. Um, but like the early 90s version, she has trousers in one of them. Um, but I still think that to be iconic is to be above real humanity. So while we still have to strive for better feminism and we have to improve pop culture, I think tearing down Wonder Woman as like a massive step in the right direction with a female director is such a mistake. And I think it's you know, nitpicking on something that actually we should be building on. Um, and so I will stop now. <laughs> I will now put the question to the House. On the motion, this House regrets Wonder Woman as a feminist icon. All those in favour? Aye. Uh.